Oh, thank you, Jim. And uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me to have the opportunity to speak uh, to you today. As a civil engineer, I've spent my entire career uh, building infrastructure, uh, managing the processes behind creating new roads, railways, power stations, and, and all the rest. Having the right numbers, having the right information has always been essential to successful construction and the operation of any piece of infrastructure. But how we think of data in the infrastructure space has changed dramatically. When I started out as an engineer, most of what we did was paper-based uh, on old-fashioned spreadsheets. We used slide rules. Mine currently resides in my sock drawer. Uh, and essentially Victorian theodolites um, rather than iPads and GPS. Data was limited in its availability and sometimes questionable in its quality. For example, the uh, information on underground services. Today, unprecedented amounts of data are at our fingertips in an instant. New technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, offer the potential for the UK's existing infrastructure to become smarter and work as an optimised system. Data is now as important to UK infrastructure as concrete or steel. There's no joke. Pe data is like people. Interrogate it hard enough and it will tell you whatever you want to hear. Merely collecting data alone will not improve the nation's infrastructure. Neither will running numbers in the way that we've always done. The key is not just the quality of the data, but how we process it and finally how and where we use it. Which is why today's launch of the UK Data and Analytics Facility for National Infrastructure is an important step forward in using our data to transform how we think about infrastructure. The UK relies on effective infrastructure to drive sustainable growth, improve our competitiveness and improve the quality of life for everyone. At the NIC, our role is to provide the government with independent and evidence-based advice on what the infrastructure the UK will need looks like up to 2050. It includes considering the need for new infrastructure, whether renewable power, fibre broadband or water transfer systems. What financing, models, what financing models are needed and how can we best use new technologies. Our work is also about ensuring that we make the best use of the existing infrastructure systems that we already have or already plan to create. And when it comes under pressure from a growing population or risks being knocked out by extreme events such as flooding, being able to reassure communities and businesses that their infrastructure services are sufficiently resilient so, as a Commission, we pr our purpose is ensuring there is a plan for effective, cost-efficient, reliable infrastructure for the next 30 years and beyond. It's quite a challenge. Of course, it requires a long-term perspective of the UK's future needs. But as we know only too often, decisions about infrastructure are subject to short-term considerations. The urgent takes place and priority over the important and the urgent always shouts the loudest. The Commission's role is to ensure that the rational, considered, researched view of infrastructure is heard and, importantly, acted upon. I'd like to mention two ways in which we're doing that through the National Infrastructure Assessment, which we published for the first time last July, and our resilience study for, whom, for which we are now completing the scoping phase. The UK's National Infrastructure Assessment is, I believe, a strong foundation stone on which to build a new approach to how we do long-term infrastructure planning in the UK. Can I remind you of some of the headlines from that assessment? Digital connectivity, for example. Broadband digital technology is no longer a luxury. It's an essential utility. It's fundamental to business and our daily lives as water and electricity. While connectivity is now the norm, it's only a matter of time until the limits of what our current network can provide. We say in the assessment that the UK needs a nationwide plan led by government to deliver full fibre broadband to all homes and businesses by 2033. That broadband fibre capacity, of course, will potentially have sufficient capacity for the rest of this century. Now, while the private sector should deliver much of this, the government needs to set a deadline and support investment 
especially in places such as rural communities. This spring, we've seen clear evidence of increased public concern about the environment and the need for action to address climate change. Building a low-carbon economy is central to our assessment. We set the government the challenge of moving to at least 50% of our electricity coming from renewables by 2030. The offshore wind sector deal is a positive step forward in that regard, not least in securing the UK's position as a world leader in renewables technology. But there needs to be a similar momentum built up and a change of government mindset around onshore wind and solar to ensure a rich mix of renewable sources of energy. As part of this low carbon economy, we also want the government to accelerate the shift to electric powered transport. We believe we could have 100% of new cars and vans sales electric by 2030. Our assessment calls for a truly national, visible, rapid charging network. Only then can we, can we encourage and reassure consumers and address their biggest fear, range anxiety. So we need to make it happen and get that charging infrastructure in place. That's why the Commission is currently calling on the Chancellor to charge up Britain. On transport, we propose that 43 billion additional funding over the next 20 years and new powers be devolved to city leaders and metro mayors. Our cities need the capacity to make long-term plans to improve local transport, which in turn will boost product productivity and growth. We believe that they're best placed to know what their communities and businesses need to thrive. Devolved powers and devolved budgets to match would truly represent a major shift in government thinking when adopted. Now that's a gallop through some of the headlines in our assessment. I haven't mentioned our other recommendations on water, waste and recycling, flood resilience, design or future financing, but I hope it indicates how comprehensive it is. The government has promised to respond in full through its forthcoming national infrastructure strategy. Last month, I wrote to the Chancellor setting out four tests for an effective strategy. A truly long-term perspective, clear goals and plans to achieve them, a firm funding commitment in line with the upper limit of the agreed guidance, which is 1.2% of GDP a year invested in infrastructure. That's purely from the public sector. The private sector is already investing a similar amount and a genuine commitment to change of how things are done. This strategy, we are promised, is going to come in the autumn. Given recent events and a new Prime Minister stepping into number 10 before the summer, I regret that things may be subject to change. But we've been heartened that a number of leadership candidates have already set out their stalls and appear to believe and see that investment in infrastructure is one way of both uniting a divided nation and supporting our economy. We believe that there should be a broad agreement on the priorities which we've set out, and that the assessment provides a clear plan for the UK's infrastructure in the decades up to 2050, regardless of who the Prime Minister is. When we started work on the assessment, one area that we recognise will be particularly challenging is understanding resilience. We were able to make some progress in a couple of key sectors. The assessment highlights the need for a long-term strategy to ensure that all community, communities are resilient to severe flood events by 2050 and increase resilience to drought through a national water network. We also identified that smart capability and resilience should form an important part of the infrastructure design process. Last month we announced the members of our design group who were considering just these sort of topics. We also highlighted the importance of undertaking more in-depth analysis of infrastructure resilience, as we had originally identified in the response to the process and methodology uh, consultation, which we held in 2016. So naturally, we were pleased when the Chancellor asked the Commission to undertake a resilience study to determine how to ensure that the UK's infrastructure can cope with whatever future changes, disruptions, shocks and accidents it faces. The Chancellor asked the Commission to do a number of things. Review the existing approaches to the resilience of current and future infrastructure. Understand what the public expectations are in response to the potential loss of infrastructure services. 
to develop an analytical approach that can be used to better understand the resilience of economic infrastructure systems and to pilot the analysis of infrastructure systems to identify actions to improve resilience. Well, we've been busy since the announcement to build a picture of existing knowledge, approaches and initiatives. Our team has commissioned reviews of existing levels of service at home and abroad, improving our understanding of existing frameworks for assessing resilience. They've also commissioned work on public expectation and attitudes and undertaken a public consultation. And we've also held a successful problem definition workshop with a group of experts. It's taken a lot of work just to get to this first stage. And we're grateful for your engagement so far through undertaking short studies, answering our questions or sharing our views. So what happens next? Towards the end of this month, we'll be publishing our scoping report for the study. This build on, builds on the work that the team has done, as well as the work they've commissioned and the public consultation. It'll set out the priority areas the study will address to ensure that the next National Infrastructure Assessment, which will be published in about 2023, asks the right questions and proposes the best solutions about resilience. The launch of Daphne provides a strong platform to help us to do this. It gives us the opportunity to ensure that the recommendations which we make in the next assessment will be, best on the, will be based on the best data and data modelling. It will crucially enable us to develop our understanding of how increasingly interconnected infrastructure systems work and affect each other. It's clear from the scoping phase that there is widespread recognition that this study is timely. There is enthusiasm from right across the infrastructure sector to help ensure that the study generates the right outcomes. We want to continue to draw upon that enthusiasm and the support which you have already provided. For instance, as part of the scoping report, we'll be publishing a call for evidence. Your data, insights and suggestions will be vital. Your input will help us to draw sensible conclusions and develop recommendations which will improve the infrastructure systems that we rely on. Next month, it will be one year since we publish the National Infrastructure Assessment. We think it's the right approach for the UK. We've been busy making that case to ministers, MPs, officials, business and in the media. That assessment offers a clear, achievable and affordable vision to, for the UK up to 2050. What happens next is down to the government. We've seen positive responses through the government's adoption of our recommendations, for example, on reducing water leakage and tackling waste. But those were easy wins. Real change is required to transform the UK's approach to long-term planning. The next assessment, of course, isn't due for a number of years. However, time does fly. And we're already thinking about what it will need to cover. So I hope you are all thinking about that as well. So the earlier and deeper you can engage with the Commission and this study in helping us to shape a new methodology for resilience, the more opportunity you will have to help shape the approach to the National Infrastructure Assessment coming in a few years' time. And with access to the new Daphne platform, that process of collaboration and creative thinking should become just a little bit easier. Thank you.